All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Joe Hollis, and we are at Mountain Gardens. And we were supposedly doing a plant walk, uh, but now everything's virtual, so we are going to film what we can of a plant walk uh, here. We'll see how far we get, and then there'll be a question and answer session afterwards. Um, so this is my place, Mountain Gardens. I call it a paradise garden or a botanical garden of useful plants. I've been here, uh, I bought this land in 1972, at which time it was all wooded. So I've cleared out the center part of the garden and uh, I've been growing a variety of useful plants, but I've somehow ended up with a sort of specialty in medicinal herbs, both Chinese and native. Uh, and another specialty we have is perennial vegetables and wild food plants. And in both cases, I do a lot of work with the uh, with the relationship between East Asia and Eastern North America. Uh, there's a very similar climate and also the plants are related. So there's ginseng in Eastern Asia, ginseng in Eastern North America, no ginseng anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's called the great disjunction between Eastern Asia and Eastern North America. The plants are closely related. So we do a lot with that. Uh, so there's medicinal Solomon seal in Asia and there's medicinal Solomon seal in Appalachia. Uh, my property originally, what I bought in 1972 was 2.8 acres, uh, and I have since added a little bit more. I might now have about five acres altogether. So here we have a map of the property. At the moment, we are in this building up here. All up here and over here is National Forest which is very nice. So I can build right up against my boundary. Uh, so we're going to walk out and over towards the yard and then we're going to gradually work our way back and forth. There's some greenhouses here we want to look at. And down, there are several structures here, a little yurt, a cabin, another yurt. This is my house. Uh, so I usually have uh, about a half a dozen apprentices here and they stay in these various little shelters, big outdoor kitchen here. So this has all been this is my, was my original clearing, and the ground is about 80% rocks, so we used the rocks to make uh, terrace walls. So this is all terrace, sloping downhill. So we'll be walking around down through here, and then we've opened up a new part of the garden out here because this gradually got too shady. So a lot of our food production and some of our medicinal herbs are out in this part of the garden now. Uh, so, yeah. There's a couple little ponds here and there. So just to give you an overall overview of what the whole property looks like. And we'll spend a few minutes uh, looking around at what we do inside here in the herb shop, and then we'll go outside. Because mainly what this day is all about is looking at a lot of plants and talking about how they grow, ecological conditions, propagation, and so on. I'm not going to talk a lot about what these are used for. I figure you all know that stuff already and other people are teaching that. My specialty is how to grow them, the ecology and cultivation of a big variety of medicinal herbs. So this is my, uh, this is like a common room for the apprentices. We've got a very nice library. Uh, this is all medicinal herb books over here. This whole section, Chinese, native, how to grow, how to use, etc. I call this a self-help herbal health center. I do not give any health advice. I don't do any diagnosis or prescribing. But people are welcome to come and use the library for uh, self-diagnosis. And then uh, we've got a huge variety of herbs back here. So let's walk back into the herbs. The back part is the herb shop. All right, so now we are standing in the herb shop proper. Uh, and what we do is, well, there's several things. This is a collection of Chinese herbs. Most of these, and they're all arranged in the classic Chinese way, release the exterior, you know, and then uh, clear heat, drain fire, and so on, down to the uh, respiratory and digestive and so on, blood movers, blood tonics, and we finally get into the tonics, the adaptogens, and then the astringents and the calm the heart, settle the spirit, etc. So these herbs in these jars come from China. 
but uh, probably 80% of this is growing in my garden. We just don't produce enough quantity to uh, fill these jars, A. And B, we have a lot of trouble drying. Now we have a brand new herb dryer this year that we might get a look at. So maybe, you know, theoretically there's a number of these where we could be having our own herbs in the jars. But in the meantime, so as I said earlier, we're kind of a botanical garden. We're not really a farm. I mean, I'm a botanical garden. I've got a certain amount of each plant, you know, maybe just a dozen that we can propagate from and collect seed and so on. We're trying to move into actually producing enough herbs to do things with. The herbs that we harvest, uh, we tend to tincture. So you get a lot more mileage out of them that way and uh, you don't need as much herb. Uh, and we can use them fresh. Drying them is not an issue, usually. I mean, there's some herbs that you need to dry before you tincture, but in general you can tincture fresh herbs, which is very convenient. So these are all single herbs, uh, either things grown in the garden or things that we wildcraft in the woods. Uh, and then we also make a whole range of formulas. So all across the top here are Chinese, mostly Chinese uh, class, classical formulas. We don't make up our own formulas. We get them out of various books, Bensky and so on. And they're for all different purposes. A lot of immune boosting things, tonics, adaptogens, uh, colds and flus and uh, insomnia and broken bones and just a whole list, you know, respiratory system, digestive system. This is all on the website. If you're interested in what we have, there's a whole list of the formula tinctures and the actions and indications. So the idea is a person can come in here and it's self-service. Uh, $15 for a two ounce bottle and you can mix several things into the bottle if you want. So we do this mainly for the neighborhood. Uh, I don't try and market these. They're not made according to, we don't have the facility to do the whole good manufacturing practices thing. So we do this for the education of the apprentices and for the neighborhood. At the moment we're doing a lot of antiviral stuff. So all these bottles that are sitting here are uh, antiviral form, herbs and formulas. Isatis, woad is turning out to be a very important one. Uh, what do I see here? Usnea and Japanese knotweed. These are all important antivirals. We're working with uh, Stephen Buhner's very good book on herbal antivirals. He lists his uh, top seven antivirals, I think, of which five of them are, can be grown here and are growing here. Unfortunately, the most important ones, according to him, come from Africa and there's no propagating material even available in America. We're also working with a lot of formulas we've gotten online. So we've got a half a dozen different uh, formulas that they are being used successfully in China to combat the virus. Uh, and we've made up a lot of those. Pneumonia prevention formula, Cheng number one. We've got uh, five or six formulas uh, from China that are available. At the moment, we're still pushing just uh, immune boosting. You know, but if people start to actually get sick, then a lot of these formulas are going to kick in. For immune boosting, the big one is uh, Jade Screen. That is the number one immune boosting formula in China. But we make several others, Immunity 3, uh, Rishi, and uh, Rhodiola, Astragalus are the big herbs. So all of this is available. Uh, yeah, and then we have a seed business. Can we swivel over here a little bit? Seed cabinet. We're off the grid. If I, if I had more electricity, I would have a freezer and all these seeds would be in the freezer, but we don't. So this is the best we can do. But we try and uh, offer seeds of a lot of things that are not widely available. And then we have a plant nursery as well. And we sell uh, plants bare root. We can also ship them. I know a lot of you are probably regretting that this 
conference is not happening because I'm always there selling my plants and it's usually very popular. But we can ship plants bare root. We just dig them up when you order them, you know, wrap them up in a paper towel and so on and send them off to you and it seems to work very well. I had almost no complaints. So that's available in lieu of, uh, and then for anybody who lives in this area, uh, we have potted up plants for sale and we also have, this building is closed, but the gardens are open. Welcome to come and walk around the gardens. And then we've taken some of the most important uh, formulas and put them in a little shed down by the driveway. Uh, so all kinds of possibilities. If you, if you live in, uh, in the Asheville area and want to come out, just get in touch with me. Email is the best way, johollisherbs at gmail.com. It's all on the website, Mountain Gardens Herbs. All right, I think, uh, I think we should go outside and look at some plants. Okay, here we are right on the edge of the National Forest. Everything behind me is National Forest and everything this side is Mountain Gardens. And you can see it's kind of a wild jumble of things. Uh, it's a wild jumble most of the time, but this year in particular, because I have way less help than I usually have, so everything is just doing its thing. Uh, there's some things we can look at right here. This is woods nettle, which I eat every morning. My favorite of the, probably, we probably have 20 or 30 edible spring greens in this garden. But I think this one's the best, Laportia canadensis. It's related to urtica, but it doesn't sting nearly as bad. Stings just slightly. Uh, really delicious. And I'm backed up in that by the current wild foods guru, Samuel Thayer. It's also his favorite, spring greens. Also a good fiber plant, 600 times stronger than cotton or something like that. Indians use it for that. So this is abundant in these rich woods, as opposed to urtica, which is more like an alluvial streamside kind of plant. And then right next to it here, we have golden seal. There's golden seal all over in here. Golden seal, golden seal here and here. Here, it's just kind of mingling into things. It's back here. There was no golden seal when I moved here. That's all golden seal back there. Uh, I brought it in and it's doing very well. So golden seal, to look a little more closely. Uh, they come up and they're blooming about when they come out of the ground. The ones that have two leaves are going to make fruit. This little fruit is going to end up looking just like a red raspberry, kind of perched in the corner of the leaf. Can't really mistake it for any other plant if you see it in fruit like that. Let's see if we can get one up here. This two prong one. We can look at the root for a minute. If I don't break it off. Eventually, uh, they start to put out little slender runners. And they'll, you know, give it another 10 or 15 years, this might be entirely golden seal. They gradually kind of crowd out a lot of other stuff. So here's the root of golden seal and I was hoping we would see the bud for next year but maybe it's a little too early and that's going to be the bud. Um, so these can be chopped up. That's not really as big a root as I thought. They get a little bit longer. Uh, when we harvest this in the autumn we will generally just break off the tip which will have the bud for next year, put it right back in the ground and then the rest of it we'll take and tincture. So you don't need to kill the plant. That is the case with almost all of these perennial herbs. If you're digging, if you want the root, you're going to be digging it up in the autumn when it's going dormant, and you will always see the buds for next year. So you can always cut off a bit of bud and some root, put it back in the ground. So other interesting plants in this area. This is wild geranium, a very nice wildflower, and it's used medicinally as an astringent for shrinking any kind of tissues that you want to shrink. This is Solomon seal, a very delicious spring vegetable. You want to eat them 
These are all just a little bit bigger than you want. The best time to eat it is when all the leaves are still in a bunch at the top. And then as it goes, one leaf unfurls and then another leaf and so on. This is our giant Solomon seal, the biggest Solomon seal in the world. Thought to be a spontaneous tetraploid hybrid from the normal uh, Solomon seal, which is only about 18 inches tall. This one can get to five feet. So this is uh, very important. Uh, what's his name? Matthew Wood has been pushing this and a lot of other people for all kind of bone and joint issues. Uh, the root can be tinctured or put into oil. And also the root can be eaten. It's got a pretty nice flavor and it stays, it's got a thing about staying kind of crunchy. It'd probably make a great pickle. So edible, ornamental, and medicinal. Really a great plant. Polygonatum commutatum. You can see how much more, sol uh, there's golden seal all over in here. There it is again. Uh, this one is called pink root, a very beautiful wildflower. Uh, not found right here, but close by in South Carolina, so I've brought it in. I've brought in a number of things. This used to be pretty important, but it's actually for getting rid of parasites, and that's just not a big problem in modern America, parasites, so it doesn't get a lot of use. Okay, so this whole area where we're standing is a plant community called uh, mixed mesophytic, meaning moisture-loving, or cove hardwoods, or rich cove. They're actually on my four acres of land. There are four or five completely different plant communities with different trees and different herbs. Uh, but most of the um, well-known Southern Appalachian wildflowers and medicinal herbs come out of this plant community. It's one of the most diverse in America. There are up to uh, 15 or so potential canopy tree species. Most plant communities only have one or two. And a similar high diversity of herbs. So solid green, as you can see. On the other hand, if you pan the camera up over here, you'll see as you go up the side and it turns into an oak hickory plant community, it's not a solid herb layer. The herb layer becomes spotty. So this is the really rich area where all the leaf mold piles up and so on. So we're looking up into the National Forest, and I don't know if you can make it out, but there are quite a lot of these white spikes sticking up. They're about a foot long, they're sort of cream colored. That's all Camelarium luteum, which is now the second most valuable thing in the woods. It's a kind of a young tonic for female women's fertility, and there's quite a big demand for it now. There was none here when I moved here. Uh, I think I'm about the only person in America offering seed of this plant, which definitely needs to be grown. It's gonna become endangered pretty quickly. So this is just a variety of these uh, rich cove plants. Uh, this is one of particular interest at the moment, a false unicorn root or fairy wand. These are either male or female. This one's a male, we'll see some more. As we walk around, I can show you a female. This is used for women's fertility, uh, and it's much in demand. It's up to about $80 a pound. This plant's going to become endangered real quick because it's so showy. You know, ginseng, which is up around $800 a pound, but ginseng, you kind of got to get right on top of it to even see it. Whereas this thing, you can see from 50 yards away in the woods. So it's going to get over harvested. It really needs to be cultivated. If you've got the proper uh, land, then it seems pretty tolerant. I've seen it often uh, close to rhododendrons and so on. Hemlocks, which are now almost gone. Some other interesting plants that are in here. Uh, ramps. So ramps are a spring ephemeral. They pop up early, early. As soon as things warm up a little bit in the spring, like in March, the ramps come up. When the trees leaf out, the ramps disappear. Although, uh, if they're going to flower and make seed, once the leaves are totally gone, then up will come a seed stalk. And you can harvest the seeds on towards 
uh, August or September, little round, black, shiny, onion-type seeds. Ramps also need to be cultivated. They're being very much over-harvested, and it takes seven years to grow a ramp from seeds. The only way they multiply is by seeds. So if you've got some nice, rich woodland, good plant to grow, something else, the Indians always just harvested the leaves, which is great. Then we would have ramps forever. But that's not what's happening. People are digging them all up. Uh, there's trillium in here, also known as birth root. That's a medicinal herb. That's a very classic wildflower of these rich coves. They come in several different colors, white or a sort of a maroon color. It's sprinkled all around in here. Um, another plant of considerable interest to me that I'm trying to work with is this uh, Canada Lovage, Ligusticum canadense, also known as boar hog root. has a reputation as being a kind of an aphrodisiac with certain cultural groups, so I sell a lot of that to people who want it for that purpose. Ligusticum is a, a big genus in Chinese medicine. Uh, there are a number of Ligusticum species. And then out west you have osha root, the famous uh, root that the grizzly bears dig up and rub on their faces. Nobody's quite sure why, uh, but there's videos of that that you can look at on YouTube, I believe. So this one is called Eastern osha root by some people. Osha is considered the most important uh, immune-boosting herb from the Rocky Mountains. Uh, this one is actually a little out of place. This is more typically found on ridges. The Indians say it occurs where the green ends. So I just mentioned how the cove hardwood is all green, and then as you go up the hillside, the green ends. <laughs> And you see a lot more brown. So right at that interface is where this plant is typically found. So sometimes quite abundantly. This is also uh, one of the Cherokee Indians' very favorite spring greens. So you would eat it uh, probably a little bit earlier, you know, maybe a week ago. All right, I just want to mention this plant. This is uh, Raelia racemosa, spikenard, or the local dialect, spignet. So the ginseng family uh, is actually the Aureliaceae. So this is the type genus of the Aurelias. So this is related to ginseng. Uh, this is one of the biggest herbs you're gonna see in the woods. It's gonna get clusters of little uh, uh, purple berries later on that people like to eat or tincture. It's a huge big root. Roots go out in all directions. And used primarily for respiratory system issues. Uh, sometimes you see it quite abundantly, and then we will see in a few minutes uh, the Japanese equivalent to this, Aurelia cordata. So as I say, there's a lot of closely related stuff. So we've got Asian ginseng, American ginseng, you've got American spike nard, and we've got Asian spike nard. And other things we're looking at in here is black cohosh. It's all around here, and then quite a bit more of the Beautiful trilliums, more of the woods nettle, more of the geranium. I hadn't mentioned bloodroot yet, Sanguinaria canadensis. I'm not going to dig this one up, I don't know. Well, I suppose I could. It's right there on the edge of the path. Bloodroot's another one that's getting uh, over-harvested badly. It's all going to Europe for them to put into animal food. Hmm. The Europeans are a bit smarter than us about overuse of antibiotics. I think everybody's aware at this point that Almost all of our antibiotics are useless because we've saturated the environment with them uh, because we put them into cattle feed. And the reason we do that is not because we're worried about the cattle getting sick from standing around and shit all day. 
it's that they gain more weight. So you get a better ratio of, of how much feed you're giving to how much weight the animal is getting with the antibiotics. I can't remember, I used to understand why, but in any case, in Europe, they don't put antibiotics in their animal feed anymore, and they found that bloodroot works. So our bloodroot is flying out of the woods. Uh, this can also be divided. Uh, Indians use it also as a dye. Uh, it's been put in toothpaste. It's very good for uh, anti-plaque kind of thing, or gum disease and so on. It's gonna make seeds. They're typically Memorial Day is when these pop open, and you can't open them up any sooner. <laughs> the day before they're ready, they're not ready. Uh, and then they will be carried off, hopefully, by ants who want to eat this little bit that's attached to the seed. And if, it's, if they do that, the germination is about 80%. But if you just collect the seeds and try and plant them, your germination is going to be about 20%. Uh, and there's another spring ephemeral. If, if the conditions are right, sometimes it'll stick around for the summer, but oftentimes once the seeds are ripened, it'll just uh, disappear. Beautiful uh, spring wildflower. It's one of the first things to bloom in the spring. And bunches of other stuff to look at here. So we got both black cohosh and blue cohosh in here. This is black cohosh back here, and there, and there. There's half a dozen of them here. At some point, we might see some that are putting up their flower stalks. I don't see any right here. Uh, it's a very beautiful wildflower. It has a tall five or six feet uh, spike of little white flowers. This is blue cohosh here, so-called because it gets fruit, uh, which looks just like a blueberry but it's not, it's just one big giant seed with a little blue skin around it. So both of these are rich cove plants. The black cohosh is fairly tolerant, you even used to see it along roadsides uh, years ago. I think the pollution's finally gotten to it. We're also seeing in here a lot of wild yam, Dioscorea velosa. That is this here, it's a vine. So these are just gonna kind of wave around until hopefully they'll find something to, to grab onto and climb. There doesn't seem to be much around here for them to grab onto, I'm afraid. There's a couple more of them back there. Uh, important antispasmodic. And maybe it's a good herb for women, maybe not. It does have some of these hormone precursors. The birth control pill, estrogen and so on, was developed from wild yams, but Mexican wild yams that had lots and lots of diostrogen in it. This, our native wild yam, does not have very much diostrogen in it. It's probably not that important of a women's herb, but it's controversial. Some say yes, some say no. Um, and these are also either males or females. So we have some of each in here. It's a little too early. They haven't started to flower yet, so I can't really tell which sex these are. And we have American ginseng in here. Here's one right here. That is a four prong, as they say, around here, meaning it has four leaves. Each leaf has five leaflets. That's called a palmately compound leaf. And it's pretty common. Blackberry leaves, raspberries, uh, Virginia creeper, lots of things have a palmately compound leaf like that. Here's another ginseng. Here's another one. <laughs> there are about a dozen of them right in this little area, which I kind of leave uh, just to demonstrate that this would not be a rare plant if it were not being uh, wildly overharvested. Uh, it does a pretty good job of propagating itself. But the seed has to never dry out. So these, there's the flower. That will turn into a cluster of little red berries, which will they'll be turning red late August on through September and even into October. And you want to get the seed out of there and it has to not dry out. And it has to go through the winter, the following summer, the following winter, and then it will germinate. So that's one of, there are a number of reasons why ginseng is so expensive and that's one of them. 
is it just takes a while to come on. And then for the first couple of years, it's not even going to look like ginseng. The first year, you're going to get two leaves, each of which has only one leaflet. I don't see any little tiny ones right here at the moment. Or I'd show you what they look like. I'm just seeing bigger ones. Uh, supposedly, uh, you want to wait until it's seven years old to have its full complement of uh, medicinal compounds in it. That's another reason why it's expensive. Uh, it's being much over harvested. So people are starting to use the leaves. Leaves are good. Uh, that way it's, it could be fully perennial. You just harvest leaves every year. The other thing you can do, and there's a video, I have a YouTube video about this, is when they get to a certain age, you can carefully dig it up and often the root is divided and you can harvest one part of it and replant the part that has the bud. So I mentioned all these perennial herbs, you can always see the bud for next year. But with ginseng, there's only going to be one bud. You can't chop the root up into pieces like you can golden seal or blood root or something and get. You just have that one bud on the neck. So the plant has a big root and then there's what's called the neck. And on the neck, you can actually count how old the plant is. Each bud moves up by about a sixteenth of an inch. All right, here is wild ginger. It's not so much used anymore. They're under a little bit of a cloud of suspicion, that whole family. There's its flower. They're called little brown jugs, and they're pollinated by beetles. There's its rhizomes. There's lots of flowers here. The rhizome is just right under the surface. That's the medicinal part. The Chinese equivalent, shi xin, is uh, used quite a bit for early stages of colds and flus. It's a little bit gingery tasting, not, I mean, you have to use your imagination. Other plants in here on the United Plant Savers Endangered Threatened List. This is uh, Collinsonia, stone root. Here's some more of it back here. This is another really big herb. Gets big giant leaves. It's mint family, square stem, opposite leaves. Used for a whole variety of, of different things, from varicose veins to horse and throat and uh, piles and whatnot. Also called wild citronella. It gets some little tiny yellow flowers and it does smell a little bit lemony when it gets into bloom. Uh, this is skullcap, Scutellaria lateriflora. There were a dozen of them here, but I dug a bunch of them up for somebody. Uh, it spreads by the roots. Like other mints, it is mint family. Not all mints spread by the roots, but this one does. And this likes a lot of moisture. If we have a dry, if we have a wet year and a wet winter, then they'll be all over the garden. And then if we have a drought summer, about 80% of it will disappear, and it'll only be surviving in the in the nice damp places. You can see I've got it right next to my little branch here. Uh, I just mentioned it because that's an important uh, sedative. All right, so if you want to grow these uh, rich cove plants, the, all you really need is leaf mold. The reason it's a rich cove is because it's full of leaf mold. So this is leaf mold. This is a couple of years old. We set up these wire hoops. You can see the one back there. Uh, it takes about two years to get to this stage, but if you dump a bunch of urine on it, it'll do it in one year. So that's where all of our urine goes. We don't throw any of it away. Very important nitrogen source. So you can use this for fertilizer, you can use this for mulch, you can use it instead of peat moss, which is a non-renewable resource, uh, in a potting mix. Uh, you know, you, you can use infinite amounts of this stuff. So we set up these wire hoops. And we don't just fill them with leaves. We get in there and jump on them. If you just have a pile of leaves, a year later you're going to have pretty much nothing. We pound this stuff in there, and then we have a nice big pile of this material available to us. So this, we have usually a dozen of these hoops set up around the garden. This one is right here next to the little branch that comes down, and in the winter when the 
there's a lot of rain, the leaves actually wash down and we harvest them out of the branch, pile them up. Nature brings it to me. All right, so I try to grow everything that I can that's in the ginseng family, which as I just said was the Aureliaceae. And it includes quite a lot of woody plants, shrubs. Uh, the best known one is Siberian ginseng but there are a lot of others, and they probably all have tonic adaptogenic properties. The Japanese love to eat, a lot of them are, are thorny to varying degrees. The Japanese really like to eat anything in this family early in the spring, it's too late now. But when they're just shooting out, before they're fully expanded, they would pick those little leaves and eat them. They're in a category called sansai, which means wild mountain vegetables in Japanese and it's very popular stuff to eat, especially in the springtime. This is sort of eye-catching, water leaf, hydrophyllum, also known as Indian salad. This is the getting to be rather well-known uh, plant called horny goat weed. It's a yang tonic it's for boosting sexual energy. It's actually used a lot by menopausal women not just horny old men. There are some hybrids that propagate very rapidly and then there are about a half a dozen true species which are rather slower to multiply. It is the leaves that are used medicinally. Here is another east-west example. That's black cohosh. This is Chinese black cohosh, sheng ma. And see the leaves are very different. Uh, although the flower stalk, if you had the flower stalk on both of them, you would be able to, to notice the similarity. Let's see, that's just another perennial vegetable, golden alexanders. This is, this is uh, American celandine, also known as woods poppy. And that's poppy family, as is bloodroot. So these have been investigated as an alternative to bloodroot. But at the moment, it's not really economical. So. We'll have to wait until we dig up all of our blood root and it gets rare and expensive and then they'll start using celandine. This is honewort, a very good uh, perennial vegetable. In Japan, this is also called Japanese parsley. The Japanese love to eat this plant, uh, Cryptotania canadensis. And then the Japanese one's called Cryptotania japonica, but a lot of people say it's exactly the same thing. Sam Thayer says that this plant makes the best vegetarian soup stock of any plant that he knows. Oh, we have a little, uh, oh shoot, I forgot. To, uh, this is a yellow lady slipper. Uh, perhaps we'll see one in bloom uh, further along on our walk. That would be a very important sedative. It was called American valerian, except of course that they're very rare and endangered and if you want to buy one, it's going to cost you about 60 bucks. So nobody's digging them up for medicine, unfortunately. Or fortunately. <laughs> There's a woods poppy that actually has a flower on it. These are the seed pods, as you can see. It does a very good job of sewing itself around once you've got it going. So we looked at the spike nard up there a minute ago. I said it was one of the bigger things in the woods, Aurelia racemosa. This is Aurelia cordata, Japanese spike nard. Similar, but somewhat different. Uh, the American one had a purple uh, stalk, which was rather smooth. This gets big, uh, 10 feet by 10 feet. And this one, unlike the American one, when this gets big, after a few years, it'll start to run. You can see one right here. So this is a very popular spring vegetable in Japan called udo, uh, but it has to be blanched. The flavor is too strong when it's green, so you've got to cut out all the light, and then they'll turn almost kind of fluorescent pink, and you eat just the stalk before it starts to leaf out, like a giant pink asparagus kind of, with a rather unique flavor. Uh, all these different... Uh, plants in the ginseng family have a kind of a similar flavor, which is impossible to describe. You just kind of have to taste it. This is another woody plant in the ginseng family. Another Aurelia, Acanthopanax is a name that's used. This already has the flower heads on it. 
A distinctive thing about the ginseng family is the flowers are in these, uh, and seeds are in these spherical clusters, which you can see going on right there. There's another one right there, also ginseng family. All right, so here's one of my specialty plants, wasabi. This is real wasabi. Uh, what you usually get in restaurants is horseradish with green food coloring. But this is a genuine wasabi. These are all of its uh, seeds. So uh, it starts blooming like in March. They tend to lay on the ground. So we got this screen to kind of hold them up because otherwise they'll just, these seed pods will just kind of dissolve into the, into the wet soil. It's almost like the plant has this intelligence because these stalks will kind of come to the ground and snake along and, and that's wherever it ends up, that's where the seed gets planted. Here again, the seed has to go through a period of cold uh, in order to germinate, but it germinates quite well. It's in the mustard family, which in general is pretty reliable for germination. So we will be offering seed of this. Now this is, uh, wasabi is tricky. So the seed grown wasabi does not make the great big roots, which is what restaurants want to buy. What makes the great big roots are certain named varieties which have to be propagated by tissue culture. They're clones. In other words, what we can harvest for this is the leaves, which is kind of a unique product uh, in a, to America. Uh, restaurants like these leaves very much. They have the wasabi flavor and sometimes they'll get quite big. Uh, you could probably even roll sushi in them or do lots of other things with it. Wasabi likes to grow near running water, cool water. So water uh, 50 degrees or less. So this is definitely a mountain plant. I don't think you could grow this down in the flatland uh, unless you want to have it indoors with air conditioning or something like that. All right, so I wanted to talk about this little tree. Uh, this tree is about 30, 35 years old probably. I don't think it's going to get a whole lot bigger than this. This is a Sichuan pepper tree. So all the restaurants are closed now, but formerly we would be picking these leaves. We would have been doing it like last week or so. We want just the tiny little leaves that are not fully expanded. Uh, the tree is called Sancho in Japanese. These leaves are used as a sort of a garnish. They have a very interesting uh, tingling effect in your mouth, kind of like lemon echinacea or something like that but very much prized by the Japanese and also by the restaurant that I work with down in Chapel Hill in Durham called the Lantern. Uh, so we'd get up with buckets and pick these tiny leaves. We might get about two pickings per year. The fruit, the seed actually, actually it's the pericarp. It's not the seed but it's the shell around the seed is the spice called Japanese uh, pepper, uh, Sichuan pepper. And then the bark is medicinal also. There are related American xanthoxylums, one of which is called toothache tree because of this tingling kind of numbing sensation. It's actually a vibration in your mouth. It's not a flavor, it's not taste buds, it's like a buzz. Other interesting things in here, this is, I talked about the honewort, Japanese parsley. It also has a maroon variety, which seems to come true from seed. We've got some cadenopsis running around in here, which is an herb that's used as a ginseng substitute, but it's also a good edible vegetable, root vegetable, very popular in Japan. It has a kind of a skunky smell to it. That's just naturalized in here. Uh, we're also looking at Houtinia. This is the variegated version of Houtinia, which is sometimes marketed as hot tuna. Uh, lots of people have bought this for a ground cover and I speculate that 99% of them are sorry they did. 
This is a super invasive plant, and once it's in, you're probably never going to get rid of it. It goes down pretty deep without like digging up your whole garden or covering it in cardboard or something. And, uh, however, <laughs> it's a very good food. It's very popular in Southeast Asia and Southern China. Uh, it tastes a lot like cilantro. If you like cilantro, you probably might like this plant. I've sold this to restaurants before. And it's one of uh, Stephen Buhner's seven top antiviral herbs. So there's good reasons to grow it. It's important in Chinese medicine, a heat clearing. It's also been called the smoker's friend because it benefits the lungs. Uh, so yeah, a very interesting plant. I would suggest uh, growing it in a container. It depends on your land situation. If you've got a lot of kind of shrubby land or somebody was up here the other day who had a part of their garden was overrun with uh, what do you call it? Artemisia mugwort, another plant that's useful but almost impossible to get rid of. So if you want to grow this, just put it in a, a big weedy area <laughs> and let it fight it out with all your other weeds. You know, if you've got a place that's overrun with blackberries, stick it in there. Alternatively, grow it in a big container. I buy these kiddie pools in midsummer when they get cheap and plant in those. Very, works quite well. All right, so pretty much everything in this whole area is either edible or medicinal, and that's true of most of the garden. There are a few weeds that have no use, but very few. Uh, this one right here is meadow sweet, Philopendula almeria, and this is the plant that gave its name to aspirin. So nowadays it's Philopendula, but it used to be spirea, and then they divided the genus up and the herbaceous ones became philopendula and the shrubby ones became spirea. So from spirea comes aspirin. And the A has to do with acetyl. So this has salicylic acid in it. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. So that's the A spirin. And salicylic, of course, comes from salix, which is willow. So these are the two aspirin type herbs we have is meadow sweet and willow bark. This is an easily grown uh, perennial flower. A lot of people just grow it as a perennial uh, border flower. It gets pretty tall. The sweet refers to aroma, not flavor, so it's fragrant. You can see there's quite a bit of it here. It multiplies. You can divide it. You can see lots more of the hutinia. This is the non-variegated one, the fishy smelling herb that I mentioned a minute ago. You can see how invasive it is. I'll never get it out of this bed. We're just having to coexist with it. Here's a nice little seedling peony of a, some kind of rare species peony. Peonies can be grown from seed. Peonies are never cheap. Uh, they don't make very much seed. The seed takes two years to germinate and then you got, we're looking at another three or four years before they flower. Uh, but they can be divided once the root gets big. You can dig it up in the autumn. You'll see the buds for next year. You can chop it up, plant it back. We'll look at the more medicinal peony in a minute. Uh, back there we have some heuchera, alum root. It's a very good astringent. And more of the purple uh, honewort. Lamium album is a women's herb, quite weedy. Uh, this is agrimony. This happens to be a Chinese variety of agrimony, or actually Japanese, Agrimonia pilosa japonica. There is a native agrimony and there is a European agrimony, uh, and they are known as soldier's herbs, meaning they stop bleeding. So, and they're quite good at that. Um, so internal, external, you could poultice it onto a wound or you could drink it for internal bleeding. And what's distinctive about them is this leaf pattern. All the different agrimonies have this kind of alternating large and small leaflets in the leaf. Uh, it's going to get little tiny yellow flowers and it'll be followed, it's actually in the rose family, and they'll be followed by little burrs that stick to your trousers. And another one, one here. This is a cute little geranium called Herb Robert, Geranium Robertianum. It just sows itself around. I think it's basically an annual. Gets all over the garden. Could be used as an astringent. 
And this one right here has gotten in every bed in my garden. Really gets around. This is uh, Panelia. It's in the Jack in the Pulpit family. You might notice the resemblance to a Jack in the Pulpit. And it makes little uh, seeds inside of there. And this is a major herb for cough in Chinese medicine called Ban Xia. The medicinal part is a little tuber, uh, the size of a little marble. And the issue with it is like most things in the Jack in the Pulpit family, not everything, uh, but a lot of the aeroids, they're called the Araceae as the family, have some toxicity. So Jack in the Pulpit, for instance, is known as Indian turnip, but they baked it for, you know, a long time in a hole in the ground to detoxify it. This one, Chinese typically detoxify this either with ginger juice or with lime. So the raw uh, herb does have some minor uses, but mainly it's the processed one that everybody wants. Ban Sha. All right, here is another Chinese herb that is also rather weedy. This one gets around by seed, so it's controllable because you, uh, you can prevent it from going to seed. The seed is actually the medicinal part. It's in the umbilifer family. As you can see, the um, APACE. And this is uh, Canidia moniaria, I mean snake's bed seeds. It's very good at sowing itself. They pop up all over the place. It's used a lot for itching. It's actually in the category of expel parasites, but its secondary use is as a yang tonic, and it's got somewhat of a reputation as an aphrodisiac. So I think there's probably potential product in this. So we're looking at uh, some plants along here. There are three different kinds of asparagus. Uh, both of these I acquired under the name of Shatavari, Asparagus racemosus, which is the number one women's herb in Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, they're obviously different. And then I've got a third one also sold to me as Shatavari, which I have in a greenhouse. Uh, so I don't know, will the real Shatavari please stand up? Who knows? Uh, it's a problem with a lot of things. And if you try and go on Google Images, you'll just get even more confused than you were. Uh, it'd be nice to be able to grow Shatavari. The name has something to do with a woman who has 40 lovers or something like that, so it's kind of aphrodisiacal. Uh, there, uh, of these adaptogens, the Chinese have been working on it for a couple thousand years, and they call them tonics. The, Hindus, the Indians, have been working on it for a couple thousand years, and they call them rasayanas, which is usually translated as rejuvenative. And then in Western medicine, nothing. Western herbal medicine does not even have a concept like health boosting. So we certainly have the plants, we just don't have the concept. Uh, but, but yeah, if you read a book on adaptogens, they're all going to be either Indian, Ayurvedic, or Chinese. So that's what these two plants are. This is an interesting Chinese herb, a beautiful ornamental clematis. Uh, Chinese name Weiling Xian means awesome, spiritual, immortal. It's grown a lot as an ornamental. Among other things, it'll dissolve fish bones that are stuck in your throat, which is not a big problem in modern America. This is a lily, a beautiful lily, one of uh, several species called Bai He. Good for the respiratory system. We make a formula called Lily Preserve Metal, metal being the lungs. There are a couple different species of lilies that are used, and they're edible. A lot of these uh, tonic adaptogenic herbs can be eaten as food. Uh, in the Chinese supermarket I go to, they have a whole aisle of medicinal herbs. But it's not all the medicinal herbs, it's just the ones that you eat. So you just make some meat and vegetables and these herbs and cook it up like a stew. And so the lily would be one of the ones you can do that with. All right, this plant right here is Cotonopsis. It's another vine. 
It's going to climb all up into here. It'll get as big as the asparagus eventually. Uh, and this is what they use instead of ginseng in China most of the time anymore. Because it does the same thing as ginseng, but it's cheaper. You can grow a big root in three years, whereas it takes you seven years to grow a little root of ginseng. So unless it's a really important uh, case, they will often substitute Codnopsis for ginseng. But you just use twice as much. It's not as strong. So it does the same thing, but you need to use more of it. It's also uh, prized as a vegetable, especially in Korea. They like to eat this, especially if it's coming out of the mountains and it's sort of wild grown. It has an interesting, almost skunky kind of a smell, like certain strains of marijuana if you brush against it. Makes quite a big, nice taproot in uh, about three years. And it's uh, happy here, it self sows. Here's another plant of it coming up. There'll be half a dozen of them. Here's one right here. Uh, that's the Chinese salvia again, the Dan Shen that we talked about previously. Here's a little primrose, Primula varus or officinalis. It's used for uh, respiratory problems. Beautiful little spring wildflower. All right, we're in another corner of the garden here, just below the greenhouse. Uh, looking at several things. So we have a big stand of our giant Solomon seal. You can see how much of it there is. We talked about that earlier being very good for bone and joint kinds of issues and also quite edible. That's Polygonotum commutatum. Now this is also a Polygonotum. Looks totally different. Uh, this is a very cool plant. This is Huang Jing. It has whorled leaves, and the tip of the leaves can actually function as a tendril if the plant wants to climb. And red flowers, it's the only Solomon seal I know of that has red flowers with green tips. Very attractive. Huang is a yellow, a very auspicious color in the Chinese way of thinking about things. And Jing is the vital essence, one of the three treasures. So this is golden vitality, you might say. It's a major uh, tonic herb in Chinese medicine, but it has to be processed. You know, process it with wine or it's, it's not even uh, good for anything. So we're starting to increase those. They're looking pretty good this year, you know. In the past it just had one stalk. Now this one has about 10 stalks. We also have in here a different kind of lily, also by her. Also good for moistening the lungs. This one makes little bulblets along the stem that fall down and it propagates from those. Propagates quite readily. Uh, are those orchids open yet? Ooh, not quite. Too bad. No, we could look at them anyway. Oh yeah, here's one. Can you see from where you are, or you could move over? So, uh, this would be the stage at which you would eat the Solomon seal. And we usually discard the leaves. So the stalk is the part you want to eat. It tastes pretty much like asparagus. I think it's even a little bit tastier and more tender. Okay, just a couple interesting things here. Uh, I was just going to mention this Indian cucumber root. It's not medicinal, it's just edible. This is one of the most delicious uh, wild foods that grows in the woods. Uh, tastes like cucumbers, sweet and crunchy. But the problem with it is that the roots never get quite big enough to be worth digging. So what I'm doing now is taking off the flowers, which is something the Chinese do with ginseng and with lots of other things. Anytime you want to get bigger roots, just remove the flowers. I'm starting to get cucumber roots that are as big as my thumb, which is definitely worth any restaurant in America would, would buy that. Um, but I specifically wanted to just point out this beautiful yellow lady slipper. Uh, I've had this for six or seven years. It had one stalk to start with. So you can see it's now got almost a dozen. 
And as I think I might have mentioned earlier, this would be an important medicinal if it wasn't so rare, endangered, threatened, expensive, whatever. It was called American Valerian, was one of the names for it. Valerian being like a prima, a really important sedative herb. Here we are looking at Dongwe, maybe, or maybe not. Uh, Angelica sinensis, called women's ginseng. Ginseng is a major qi tonic. This is a major blood tonic. Men are thought to suffer from qi deficiency, qi being energy. Women are thought to suffer from blood deficiency for obvious reasons. So this is a super important plant, if it's the right plant which I'm not sure it is, but this is what it looks like anyway. There's another little uh, Siberian ginseng there. You can see how thorny they are. And this is the plant that ramps are named for. So this grows all over in Europe in big carpets in the spring and it's eaten and it's called ramson. Then they came over to America and there's another broadleaf onion that pops up in the spring and is all over the place, and they called it ramps. Uh, this is, does have somewhat of a use medicinally. I suspect that ramps probably have medicinal uses, but being so close to garlic, I just don't think very much research has ever been done on them. There's actual ramps, just in the process of dying down, turning yellow and fading out. And here, if you want to swivel around, some more nice blue cohoshes. There's a really powerful wild yam climbing up into this dogwood. But here you can get a close-up of the uh, false unicorn root we talked about earlier up by the yurt. This is a female here. So the males start off with a big, long flower spot. The females start off with this very small one, but then it keeps stretching out. It'll eventually get like a foot long. All right, so there's a bunch of things in here, uh, but I primarily wanted to point out tea, Camellia sinensis, a really important uh, medicinal herb. It's not even usually thought of as a medicinal I mean, it's not in any Chinese herb formulas or anything, but it has tremendous medicinal properties. Uh, and we can grow it. Uh, there are many different varieties. Some of them are tender, but the, uh, this is a hardy one I got a hold of. There's a place nursery called Camellia Forest down in Chapel Hill that has about a dozen varieties of tea. So this is green tea, so you would pick, you know, there's all different grades depending on how big the leaves are when you pick it or whether you're picking little tiny buds. And then if you ferment it, if you pile it up and let it heat up, it turns into black tea or halfway in between green and black is oolong tea. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. This will tolerate a lot of shade, likes a somewhat acid soil. So I've been experimenting with interplanting it with rhododendrons. Because the big difficulty with this is it's an evergreen, a broadleaf evergreen, and over the winter they get pretty beat up. You know, you're seeing lots of nice new growth coming up. A month ago this thing looked really wretched. Uh, so a sheltered position would be very good for this if you want to experiment with growing tea. We have more plants of the false unicorn root. These all, all look like males along here. All right, so this is the other Shizandra. This is the main one, Shizandra chinensis. And you see I've got it next to my house because the big problem with this Shizandra, as with the Siberian ginseng and many other things, is it wants to bloom too early and get frozen. But this year it's actually making fruit and I just can't believe I did it, but I just broke it off. <laughs> it's only got three fruit clusters on it, and I just broke one of them trying to make it more visible. But that's 
that's it. And those are going to turn into red berries about the size of a blueberry. Well, these ones aren't. Uh, so like I said, you need theoretically a male and a female, but there are these ones on the market that are self-fertile. It's called Eastern Prince, and that's what this is. So it will be making some fruit. Uh, and you can see it also uh, spreads by the roots, so I can dig up and make, you know, a dozen plants out of this. All right, I don't think there's anything else we need to look at right here. Oh, here. This one. This is some St. John's wort. Yeah, hold, on, hold, on, hold on. Can you move the bag out of the shop? Right. St. John's wort. All right. St. John's wort the, uh, got a lot of notoriety a few years ago as herbal Prozac. Uh, there's several different species. There's a lot of species of hypericum, and some of them have the hypericin and related compounds that act as sedatives, and a lot of them don't. Uh, one way you tell is when it's getting on towards blooming, if you pinch the buds that should stain your fingers red, that's the hypericin. So this perforatum is a good one. We're at the southern end of its range. It's a little bit rare. Uh, we actually prefer to use Hypericum punctatum, which grows a little bit better in the woods. I'm not seeing any right this minute, right around here. The perforatum is so called because there's little, uh, if you hold a leaf up to the light, you can see little clear spots. That's the perforations, supposedly. So that's how you identify this one. Usually found in a sunny place, quite weedy to the north of us. And uh, it was a big problem with uh, cattle uh, because it makes cattle be photosensitive if they eat it. So the government went to a lot of trouble to uh, figure out how to get rid of this plant. So they, they brought in a beetle, a little gold colored beetle that spreads a disease. And uh, all, all, all this happened at the same time that all of a sudden it got famous as herbal Prozac. So, now it's actually a little bit difficult to grow it, even though it used to be a horrible weed, because of this disease problem. But anyway, that's the story on St. John's wort. Sunny, I see it on roadsides sometimes. As I said, we're kind of at the southern end of its range. You get up into Virginia and it's kind of in every pasture, apparently. There's another really nice baiha lily getting ready to bloom. That's gonna be gorgeous. Different jack in the pulpits. That's one of the Asian jack in the pulpits there. It's the uh, Asian uh, black cohosh again, right here. Uh, so this is a mulberry, a weeping mulberry. Uh, if it wasn't for this trellis, this would be crawling along the ground. It's very weeping. It needs to be propped up. So this is five, four or five different herbs in Chinese medicine. Sang ye is the leaf. I think is the seed. There's uh, the, the leaves are medicinal, the twigs are medicinal, the root bark is medicinal, and the fruit is medicinal. And each one has a different purpose in Chinese medicine. At the moment it's covered with little green fruits, which are almost the size they use. When the Chinese want to use flowers, they use the flower buds. When they want to use, when they want the fruit, it's almost always a green fruit. Like they have raspberries, but they're little hard green raspberries. Because by the time the fruit is ripe, the energy has already gone into seed production. So if you want the energy to be in the fruit production, you want to get it before it starts making seeds, right? So this is a beautiful plant. I wish I could figure out how to propagate it. We could use it all over the garden in little arches and so on. Uh, the leaves, if you want to get them, are supposed to be gotten right after the first frost. Uh, so that is mulberry, important uh, herb. Uh, orchardists grow it to keep the birds away from their other fruit, like if they got cherries and so on, then, because the birds will go to mulberries first. Also very good uh, plant to grow in a chicken yard. Mulberries can just fall on the ground and feed your chickens. All right, so this is the Chinese yam. 
Back there, you see we have the wild yam, the native wild yam. Uh, that's an important medicinal, but this is edible. There's kind of two kinds of yams. There's the kind that have horizontal, very woody, and utterly unedible roots. And there's the kind that have big, deep, fleshy, quite edible roots. Uh, major food sources in the tropics and uh, Polynesia, <coughs> Polynesia and so on. But there's only one of that kind of edible yam that's hardy, and that's this one here. Uh, Dioscorea batatas or Dioscorea apposita, or now it's got a different name, I forget what. And it's quite weedy. There are a number of problems about this. It's very good medicine. It's a chi tonic. It's very digestible, improves digestion. You can add it to any kind of soup or stew or anything like that you're making. It has very little flavor of its own. The Chinese really like to eat it fresh. They like to grate it and eat it. It has the remarkable qualities of being both mucilaginous and crunchy at the same time. Uh, it's a big vine. It'll get our trellises kind of caving in. We're going to need to rebuild it. It was not done properly last year. It's meant to climb out over the driveway. So Rudolf Steiner, the guy who invented uh, biodynamic agriculture, said this would be the most important food of the 21st century. He calls it, uh, the biodynamic people call it light root. And they make special boxes to grow it in. The root goes straight down, looks like a baseball bat, goes straight down, three feet at least, and you cannot pull it up. It's totally fragile. You have to excavate it by digging a huge giant hole. Or you can do like the Japanese do, which is what I'm trying, and grow it in plastic tubes, and that makes it easier to get it up out of the ground. These plastic tubes over here. These are all little seedlings. This is also called air potato plant. It makes what looks like little potatoes all along the stem. And they fall down and every one of them grows. So you end up with a wild tangled thicket of these vines uh, growing everywhere. People have started eating the little aerial potatoes. The Chinese don't seem to, but people in America are, and they're actually using that as the food part. Seems to me, theoretically, the little potatoes should be identical to the roots. Uh, they're not seeds. They're like little, they're called bulbils. So that's what all these little guys are. They're from the little aerial potatoes that fell down last year, probably. If any of them will come up out of the ground. Well, that one's actually a year old already. It takes them a couple of years to get up to size. And it dies down in the winter. There's the little bulblets. You can see every one of them is growing. They might get as big as a marble. You know, a lot of times they're smaller than that. So super easy to propagate, too easy. So, you know, uh, problematic in a number of ways. The, the biodynamic people build big boxes out of plywood, fill it with dirt, and then you can take the box apart to harvest the roots. Now, this root's going to go all the way down to here. So I would have to dig a, a crater to get the thing out intact. So these are things to think about if you want to grow the most important food of the 21st century, according to Rudolf Steiner. We also have here fever few, just kind of sells itself around. Uh, very, uh, this is a lifesaver for some people who suffer from migraine. Not everybody who has migraine, but certain people, this totally changes their lives. And then we have a very important Chinese herb right here called astragalus the number one herb for the immunity in Chinese medicine, what's called Wei Qi. So Qi is the energy that circulates around your body in the acupuncture channels. <clears throat> and some of it circulates on the surface of your body. And that's called the Wei Qi. And that is your first line of defense against uh, illnesses coming at you from outside, colds and flus and viruses and so on. 
Uh, this and reishi mushroom are the most important herbs used by Western herbalists treating cancer. <clears throat> so this comes from northern China up into Mongolia. It's very hardy. It's uh, found in uh, very dry, kind of almost deserty areas. And there are some indications that its medicinal properties are better in a, in a crappier environment than what I got. Uh, though it does flower and make seeds, but really it would probably be stronger medicine if it was growing in a very sandy, gravelly, uh, poor soil area. It is a legume, so presumably it fixes its own nitrogen. Quite easy to grow from seed. Uh, it grows pretty fast. You can even direct sow it right in the garden. I think it's probably three or four years to harvest, at which point the roots are going to be all over. You know, it's a bit of work to harvest this thing. Uh, it just kind of colonizes the ground. Very good for stabilizing the soil. So that is astragalus. You can see another one back there and another one here that does a certain amount of sowing itself. All right, this is a rhubarb, da huang, which means big yellow. It's got giant yellow roots. This is a fairly famous plant. It comes from Tibet. Beautiful ornamentals big spikes of flowers. This is a species, what well, the rhubarb we eat is a hybrid, Rum ex rhubarbum or something like that. I think you could probably eat this, but it's mainly the root that's used medicinally, and it was traded out of Tibet along the silk route ever since the Middle Ages or even ancient times. You know, silk and gold and pearls and rhubarb root. Why? Because it's good for constipation. The constipated nobility of Europe really needed this stuff. The Russians even had a, a customs post set up out in the middle of nowhere, Mongolia, to monitor the traffic in this one plant, Rum rhubarbum. Uh, so it grows pretty well. Sometimes in a hot summer it'll just check out, but then it'll come back next year. It comes from, like I said, Tibet, where it never gets hot. And then nearby it we have a little bit of uh, the Chinese chrysanthemum, Juhua, we have four different kinds of this, one yellow kind and three white kinds. Uh, so you don't just use any old chrysanthemum, it's just certain specific chrysanthemums that are used medicinally. And they're longevity herbs, they're especially good for the eyes. A very famous combination is chrysanthemum flowers and goji berries for any kind of vision problem. Super easy to grow, perennial flower, one of the last things to bloom in the year, they usually come into bloom September or sometimes even into October. All right, another Siberian ginseng there. This is one of these honey berries. It's a new uh, edible fruit coming out of Russia. Uh, there's another name for it. I can't remember right this minute. Uh, makes a fruit, looks like a blueberry, quite tasty. There are a lot of different cultivars coming on the market. They're very hardy, easily grown. Yeah. We've got five or six cultivars of it. All right, here's a few nursery plants. If anybody's in the area and wants to come out and visit, we've got some stuff potted up for sale, but also we can dig up any of these things I'm talking about. If you let us know when you're coming, Right, did you catch that last bit? Yes. Okay, good. So this is what I'm going to put over your voice. Pardon me? I'll put the, this picture when you were saying that these are yeah. plants. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we've got a little pond here, <clears throat> which hopefully will have lotuses in it one of these days. At the moment, it's just got water lily and uh, water cress and this Chinese calamus, Shi Chang Pu. And a variegated one, calamus is for the brain. Number one rejuvenative for the brain in Ayurvedic medicine is calamus. This is the Chinese one. Uh, used a lot for formulas for memory. Uh, so this is Hushawu polygonum multiflorum. I think it has a new name, fallopia or something like that. This is one of the famous longevity herbs in Chinese medicine. 
It's a uh, energy tonic. And it's a vine. The medicinal part is the tubers on the root. And the bigger they are, the better, supposedly, which would mean the older. Uh, but now it's a bit under a cloud. Uh, David Winston's new book on adaptogens, he's saying don't use it anymore. There's some compounds in there that I can't remember the name of that are not good for your liver. So a lot of people have backed off from using it. It's also known as Fo tea, which is a fake Chinese name that was invented by some marketer 50 or so years ago, but still keeps hanging around. Uh, this is a high climbing vine. If you, if you leave this alone for a, a few years, you'll end up with something like a uh, kudzu situation. You know, it'll run out by the roots and be all over everywhere. I planted it at the school and it went up to the second floor fire escape in one year and colonized up there. Fortunately, it usually dies to the ground. If it didn't, uh, the stem is a different Chinese herb called ye jiao teng which is in the calm the heart, settle the spirit category. But you get these big thick stems in China because it's not dying to the ground every year. But we don't get that around here. Maybe in Florida you would. And then another plant in here that's also a sedative, a famous one, the strongest one that's legal is valerian. You can see there's quite a few valerians here. The flowers smell very nice. The roots, which is the medicinal part, are rather stinky. These are just self-sowing. They really like this little spot in the garden. So we always have a big supply of valerian on hand. Easily grown perennial herb. Go ahead. All right, so I just wanted to mention briefly elderberry. These are looking kind of crappy. I think they got hit by a late frost, making a few flowers. Elderberries are plenty easy to grow. They like a moist kind of a situation. Uh, and this is one of the main antivirals, according to uh, Stephen Buhner. A lot of people use elderberry flowers. That's famous, very popular in Europe. But Buhner says use the leaves and the bark are much stronger. A lot of books will tell you that any green part of elderberry is poisonous. Buhner insists that it's not poisonous, it's just emetic. And that if you decoct it first before tincturing it, that will solve the emetic problem. And the other thing is just don't take too much of it. But he says that in terms of dealing with a viral infection, the flowers are just not strong enough. Or the fruit. The fruit is also used a lot for influenza. But he says the leaf and the bark. So if you're interested, you can read up in his book, Herbal Antivirals. All right, so this is the common garden peony. Uh, peony lactiflora. Uh, the Chinese name is Bai Shao, which means white peony, but it doesn't have to be white. It can be pink, red, single flowered, double flowered. All of them uh, are used the same medicinally, is my understanding. And the medicinal part is the roots. Here's the flower buds. These are going to bloom pretty soon. There are, of course, hundreds of varieties. As I said, they're never very cheap. Um, so I could dig this up in the autumn, and, and it would be a big giant root with all kinds of pink buds sticking up. Every one of these stems, and it looks like there's about a dozen on this plant. The older they get, the more stems they have. Uh, so you can take a pair of pruning shears and just cut it apart. It won't pull apart. It's just one big root, but you just chop it apart. And every piece that has a bud and some root will make you a new plant. Best time to do it is in the autumn. And then you're going to have left over from a plant like this, you know, maybe a gallon of root, uh, which is medicine. So we just take the thicker roots, the, you know, right at the crown, the roots will be maybe even an inch in diameter and they stretch on out, you know, and some of the roots can be three feet long. So it generates a lot of medicinal material and it's a famous uh, blood tonic. It goes into a lot of women's formulas, also a lot of beauty formulas for the complexion because the skin is nourished by the blood. Uh, so yeah, if you've got peonies, peonies are very, very perennial. There's, there's long-lived perennials and short-lived perennials. There's perennials that are good for three years. This plant is good for hundreds of years. 
Probably the first peony that some sea captain brought back from his wife from Japan is probably still alive on Martha's Vineyard somewhere. Who knows? Uh, wonderful plants. Um, so one last herb here. Uh, I mean, we could go on and on forever, but I think we're out of time. This is the famous goji berry. It's a big, sprawling kind of a shrub. Uh, and it's very hard to get rid of. If you decide you don't want it and dig it up, you will have a ring of new goji berry plants around the sides of the hole. Uh, it flowers in late summer and the berries are ready rather late into the winter. There are certain issues about it. It comes from Central Asia, which is about as different a climatic, climatic situation as there can be from Western North Carolina. And so our berries seem to taste a little bit more bitter, which might have to do with uh, climatic factors or it might have to do with needing to grow the exact strain of goji berry. You can buy goji berries and if, unless they're really poor quality, you can get the seeds out of them and those seeds will grow. That's, that's where some of this came from. Anyway, uh, needs a bit of training and pruning or it'll be just kind of all over place. It's very floppy herb. So that is goji berry, Lyceum chinens. There's actually two species of it. All right, so I think we're going to wind it up. We've about, I used up our time and I could go on and on and on. I can stand here, I can see a dozen more things that I could talk to you about. But uh, we want to leave some time for a question and answer session, which Presumably is going to follow right after you have watched this video. Uh, so thanks very much. It's too bad it wasn't in person. Maybe next year uh, you can come and take the actual tour. And as I said, anybody who lives in the neighborhood is welcome to come by and visit. If you let us know what you're looking for before you come, we can actually dig plants up for you and have them ready for you when you get here. Um, yeah. And 